In the far northwest of Australia, in the coastal town of Broome, Malcolm Douglas, adventurer and filmmaker, is preparing for another journey. With three mates, Wayne, Damien and Scott, he intends to spend two months exploring the Kimberley Coast, one of the great wilderness areas of the world. The men will use two Q-Craft Sea kayaks. At first glance, sea kayaks look frail and unstable, but they're a sleek combination of ancient Eskimo design and modern materials used successfully all over the world for long sea journeys. For the next two months, boss Bonnie, Malcolm's red healer, will have her own hatch behind Malcolm. She's not convinced that it's the best seat in the boat, and it takes a while to coax her aboard for a dry run. The team heads for the remote islands of the Buccaneer Archipelago, 250 kilometres north of Broome. There's limited storage space, so cameras, equipment, food and water must be kept to a minimum. Everything has its place, as they've had plenty of practice packing back in Broome. The next two weeks will be spent exploring the islands of King Sound, a maze of treacherous coral reefs, ancient eroded rocks and massive tides. This is the traditional homeland of the Badi, a seagoing tribe of Aborigines. One Badi man who retains his culture is Malcolm's old friend Tom Wigan. The men rendezvous with him. He's out hunting turtle. Damien and Scott are fascinated by Tom's traditional raft and he's equally impressed by their Kevlar kayaks. For generations, the Badi have used these unique rafts for island hopping and for hunting. They're made from a particular species of mangrove, held together with hard wood nails. Tom's one of the last Aborigines to use the old techniques for hunting turtle and dugong. times the animal was speared and after a long chase captured. Now with ropes Tom's able to control his quarry. A protected species, turtles still the favoured meat of the coastal people and they're the only ones permitted to hunt them. Tom will paddle his catch across to the mainland community where his extended family lives. He'll be back in a few days to catch up with the others on his favourite island. Once he catches the tidal currents, he'll travel swiftly. Basic food can be carried, so fish must be caught daily. The deep gutters still holding water at low tide are teeming with many species. There's not a fisherman in Australia who wouldn't like it here. continually amazed by the amount of food the younger men put away. With such healthy appetites, fishing will be a top priority. On days when the fish are off the bite, the men go in after them. There are countless sheltered bays among the islands, but this beach is Tom's particular favourite.
When he gets back, they put up some shade using driftwood and swag covers. On the main island, fresh water gushes from the rocks. The Bardi always collected their water at this spring. Collapsible water bottles are awkward to fill, so Tom employs an old Bardi trick to direct the flow. tide drops, it's time to collect food from the reefs. Twenty years ago, Malcolm camped on the islands and was shown the hunting techniques of the Bardi. Now Tom and Malcolm pass this knowledge on. In the roots of this straggly plant, Tephrosia rosea is a very useful fish poison. are crushed and mixed with sand. Out on the reef, it's deposited under the ledges in the shallow pools left at low tide. Within minutes, the toxin, rotenone, begins to work. It affects the nervous system, and the drugged fish swim erratically into the shallows. The men work quickly to beat the impatient tide. Within minutes, it will surge in to disperse the poison. A couple of jack over there too, coming up in a bit of yeah. The species most preferred by the Bardi Aborigines will be taken to the island nearby, where Tom's relatives have set up their dry season camp. Back in 1971, Tom showed Malcolm how to catch frogfish, and now he explains to Scott and Damien how these fish are only eaten when the strong southeast winds are blowing and it's too rough to catch turtles. Frogfish line a hole with dead coral, then wait at the bottom for their unsuspecting prey to dart down the shaft. When a bait's dropped in, they're easily hooked. It's a peculiar fish with a huge mouth and head and slimy mottled skin, perfectly adapted for its habitat. As the fish are released, Tom stresses that they're caught only when the weather's too bad for hunting anything else. Fast-moving trevally school in the water, streaming from the reef and just on sundown, they're easily landed for an evening meal. After two weeks among the islands, Malcolm's ready to move on, and Tom prepares what he calls a proper body feed. A young turtle. Heated stones cook the meat. And it's finished off in the hot sand. An hour later, a thick soup is collected in the shell. 
This has always been a traditional meal for the body. It's back to the Australian mainland now, for Malcolm wants to return to Broome to pick up his boat. Heavy-duty aluminium bars are strapped to the rails to carry the kayaks. No, you're right. Just go from there. The men travel far up the Kimberley coast into the gorge country. This region is so vast that it would take many months to explore all the gorges using only kayaks. his team will go far beyond where the salt water meets the fresh. They motor into a towering chasm where the muddy water shallows and for an hour it's a struggle to edge the boat to a rock bar where the kayaks can be offloaded. As the tide recedes, the mud banks are exposed, a seething mass shimmering in the afternoon sun. Countless numbers of mud skippers are feeding. Perfectly adapted for this environment, their pectoral fins are so well developed that they can walk and jump over the ooze. Mud skippers absorb oxygen through their gills, allowing them to forage over the flats at low tide. A much more fearsome animal is the saltwater crocodile. Fresh tracks alarm Malcolm. A big croc must have been lurking nearby in the muddy water when they offloaded their kayaks. These isolated waters are also home to the mighty Barramundi, a great fighter and superb eating. Wayne's lucky to land this one. He's hooked it in the tail. few places so remote as these magnificent Kimberley chasms. It takes stamina to manoeuvre the kayaks over the huge boulders blocking the river. Between the rock jams lie long stretches of deep fresh water where progress is easy and fish are plentiful. They camp overnight on soft sand. At times during the wet season, this ledge would be 20 metres underwater. The morning sun highlights the ancient sandstone cliffs, revealing colours more vivid than anywhere else in Australia. is now so rugged that the kayaks have to be manhandled long distances between water holes. Mm -hmm. 
Few Europeans would ever have been on this river. Fresh fish, as usual, is on the menu. Golden catfish are bigger and much better eating than the smaller varieties. After two days spent exploring the gorge, Malcolm feels that the team should return to camp before the spring tides push too much water past the boat. Back at the rock bar, there's a major disaster. The high spring tides have arrived earlier than expected. The boat's stranded precariously and only the aluminium bars stop it rolling over. Malcolm checks the fuel tanks for leaks. All the gear's fallen in a heap on the low side. It'll be a big job cleaning up this mess. Malcolm had not reckoned on a rise in the tide for another day or two. And as the sun sets, it's a race against time to right the boat before nightfall. The boat has to be leveled or water will flow over the stern around midnight. Working frantically, the men finally manoeuvre the boat down into the gutter, and Malcolm spends the night aboard to ensure that all's well in the morning. On the incoming afternoon tide, the team head for the Isdel Gorge. After kilometres of mangrove-lined mudflats, the river narrows through the vivid, ochre-coloured cliffs so typical of the Kimberley. With the spring tides covering the rock jams, Malcolm's able to take the boat far inland to a massive chasm. Barramundi are always found where a clear, fresh stream meets muddy salt water. Wayne, who's never landed a really big barra, is elated. And heads back to camp to cook lunch. In his 25 years exploring the Kimberley, Malcolm has never seen this part of the country. 
Using the sleek kayaks, the men are able to push into unknown territory. jams become more numerous and more difficult to negotiate. Magnificent cliffs tower above the canoes. campsite they can find is on a smooth water-worn rock ledge. Luxuriant vegetation flourishes where pure spring water flows from the cliffs. Reluctantly, the men head back to the boat before the big tides drop off and leave them stranded. Scott's been desperate to catch a barramundi and as they wait for the tide on the last morning, he succeeds. Behind them stretches the magnificent Isdel Gorge that Malcolm believes must be protected as one of Australia's great wilderness areas. From here, it's four days travelling back to Broome. Ahead lies the most adventurous part of their journey. north, a thousand kilometres, up the Gibb River Road, heading for the Mitchell River. The road winds through the brilliantly coloured King Leopold Ranges. Late in the afternoon, the weather deteriorates and morning finds the men recovering from a miserable night. Rain in the middle of the dry season is most unseasonal and everyone's soaked. After the rain, the prawns should be on the move. So while he waits for the swags to dry, Malcolm baits his nets. His first catch is interesting, but not what he's after. These small turtles are common in the Kimberley freshwater rivers. Damien has more luck. These huge freshwater prawns are called cherubim. And either boiled or roasted in the coals for a few minutes, they're delicious. near the camp, Grevillea is blooming. 
Most grevilleas ooze a honey-like nectar, and this one's no exception. It's good bush food. Sweet and filling after a feed of cherubin. The rain clears, but the road's still impassable, so the men head downriver. They come upon a colony of black flying foxes. These raucous animals usually leave their camp around sundown, flying up to 50 kilometres to feed on blossoms and wild fruit, returning before dawn to rest during the day. When disturbed, the bats in the lower branches climb higher before launching into cumbersome flight in a scene of dizzy confusion. When the kayaks leave, the bats soon return to their roost to preen and sleep. Drysdale River cattle station, there's a shop, a garage, and a phone and a fridge for tourists heading up the Gibb River Road. Malcolm rings Kununurra Airport to confirm his helicopter booking. A chopper will be needed to carry the kayaks into the Mitchell River, and the men plan to paddle all the way down to the Kimberley Coast. The track west winds through large stands of Livingstonia palms, the most striking natural feature of the plateau. A few kilometres from the Mitchell Falls at the end of the track is the pre-arranged rendezvous with the helicopter. It's due in 24 hours, so the men hike into the Mitchell Falls, an unspoiled wilderness that's becoming a popular trek for the more adventurous round Australia travellers. Malcolm had planned to put the kayaks in here, but there's not much water flowing over the falls, so a helicopter will have to take them downstream. A reconnaissance trip in the helicopter is planned for the following day. Early in the morning, a radio check confirms that the helicopter's on its way. survey of the river begins immediately. Below sprawls the majestic grandeur of the Mitchell Escarpment. too shallow and rocks jam the course. 
it will be impossible to paddle through this section. Downriver in the tidal zone, there's plenty of water. concealed under some prominent rocks and shielded from the hot afternoon sun. Markers are placed high in the mangroves where they'll be visible from the kayaks. Turn to base camp, tension builds while the kayaks are made ready for the haul downriver. Thirty minutes later, months of planning is wrecked. When the kayaks are smashed on the rocks in a freak accident. The damage is too great to be patched up out here in the bush. seems to understand that their adventure has gone disastrously wrong. Reluctantly, Malcolm decides that the kayaks will have to be taken the thousand kilometers back to Broome for repairs. When the men have all been picked up, the long journey south begins. materials are air freighted from Perth and day by day Wayne, a fiberglass expert, gradually reshapes and strengthens the kayaks. Two weeks later with everyone's spirits high, it's up the Gibb River Road again. It's August, the best time of the year and the stockmen are out mustering. Back at their original camp, they prepare for another attempt to transfer the kayaks. Everyone's anxious. As the hook connects with the net and slowly and cautiously, the kayaks are swung over the rocks to the river. follows the Mitchell down to the brown salt water. From this point, it will be possible to reach the sea. This time, the kayaks are lowered without mishap into the spinifex, well back from the gorge. Once again, the men are on their own. After all the hassles of the past fortnight, a day is spent hiking upstream. And what a perfect place to relax, cool and tranquil.
paperbark is the aluminium foil of the bush. It's always been used by the Aborigines for preparing and cooking food. These sooty grunter, or as they're more commonly called, black brim, are baked in their skins. The best way to cook fish in the bush. Nothing's wasted. The extra fish will be eaten later. In the morning, everyone's keen to move on while it's still cool. It takes a few hours to get the kayaks and all the gear down through the rocks and spin effects to the river. Twenty hours later, the water fails to arrive. The kayaks will have to be moved further downstream. Malcolm and Damien struggle on in the mud gradually moving to where there should be some more water on the high, neat tide. The rest of the gears manhandled over the huge rocks along the bank. tide finally arrives, dangerous saltwater crocs appear. After they've cleaned up, the kayaks are packed. And the men finally begin their journey down the Mitchell, one of the most inaccessible waterways in Australia. Crocs are inquisitive, but they're not a serious threat. At this time of the year, when it's relatively cool, the bigger ones are less aggressive and usually keep their distance. The styrene box between the paddlers holds a movie camera. Some days, finding a campsite is a major problem. The team must get up onto high ground before the tide drops, leaving them stranded for the night in the slushy mud. Down in this section of the river, there are plenty of crocs. Each day, the men break camp on the high tide. Malcolm's careful to keep his licensed pistol in good working order. It would be their only protection in a croc attack.
Celebrations all round, especially for Scott and Damien when the party reaches the food drop. At last, they can eat all the baked beans they want. There's a lot of discussion about where to camp before the men head for shore. The kayaks must be safely beached before the tide goes out, leaving hundreds of metres of mud banks exposed. This far northwest coast of Australia, like so much of the Kimberley, is rarely visited. Food supplies are low again and waiting for the tide, Malcolm's on the hunt for mud crabs. Meat deteriorates so rapidly in the heat that the crabs must be picked up and kept alive until Malcolm returns to camp. This old warrior has a nipper and half his legs missing. He's not even worth the effort. His shell would be almost empty. After walking for hours on the mud flats, Malcolm uses the desalinator to quench his thirst. This amazing piece of equipment enables the men to survive adequately without a ready supply of fresh water. Everyone takes a turn pumping. Salt water is forced under great pressure through ultra-fine filters. Only a small amount of fresh water is separated after each pump, and the rest, containing the minerals and salt, discarded. An hour's work supplies enough water for the afternoon. It's the middle of the dry season, and the maximum daily temperature is still in the mid-30s, so four men and a dog need a lot of water. For a few days, no fish have been caught. So out towards the river mouth, Malcolm and Wayne are lucky to pick up Trevally on the trolling lines. Almost immediately, the quivering fish attract sharks. They're so aggressive, the men give fishing away and paddle into a side creek to look for more food. nets baited and set. They head into the mangroves to look for snails. Mangrove snails move up the branches, staying above the water line as the tide rises. Malcolm expected the young crocs to have taken the crabs that were moving in on the bait, but he's in luck. The big ones will be taken back to camp.
The mangrove snails, simmered for a minute or two, are delicious. The men camp at the mouth of the Mitchell River on one of the most isolated stretches of the Australian coast. North from here, the Timor Sea stretches to the islands of Indonesia. Hungry for another big feed of fish, they work their trolling lines on the rising tide. The fish are biting, but so are the sharks. Bronze whalers and black-tipped reef sharks arrive in frightening numbers. Bonnie's lucky she isn't grabbed on the nose. Damien can't believe such ferocity. The sharks launch into a feeding frenzy and instinctively, everyone keeps their arms well clear of the water. Paddling to another area, Scott and Damien are each able to land two good-sized trevally. These fish might look big, but they'll be finished off in no time. With the Mitchell River now far behind, they head for a rendezvous point. The desalinator is in constant use. In this climate, dehydration can be dangerous. Pushing through rough seas and hazardous tides, they eventually reach the calm waters of Crystal Creek. Here, where an old mining track winds down to the coast, Malcolm has arranged for a young stockman to pick them up in the vehicle. After two months of excitement and adventure in the kayaks, they're pulled from the water for the last time.